want more omega threes, and we need yes. to eat them. So yes. where do we get them from, and how much should we have a day? Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, the you know the <clears throat> the optimal way to do it, of course, is with nutrition, with food. And so, where do you get it? Well, do you get it from seafood primarily? Uh, that's where uh, actually EPA and DHA are. are begin their life, they are synthesized originally in the single celled, what we call microalgae uh, in the uh, oceans, uh, sunlight, carbon dioxide, et cetera, water. You make these long chain, these single celled mol- or, um, organisms make it. And then, and then it just kind of goes up the food chain. You know, mm-hmm. the, the, the big fish eat the little fish, the little fish eat the microalgae, that kind of thing. Because uh, fish don't really make omega-3 any better than we do. Uh, they have to eat it. Uh, and so the best fish for consuming high levels of omega-3 per serving is uh, there's an acronym that we and others have come up with called SMASH, S-M-A-S-H. And it starts with salmon, mackerel, mm-hmm. anchovies, S-M-A-S, sardines, herring. Uh, those are rich and I, I would add also albacore tuna, white tuna is, is high in mm. omega-3 relative to the chunk light pink tuna uh, that you get. So smashed with a T. Mm. Um, we, unfortunately, in, in the U.S. particularly, uh, and, and probably most of the West, haven't developed a taste for many of those fish, uh, particularly the ones that taste, well, fishy. Um mm. Uh, so, but, but still, you know, eating a, a serving of those once a day would give you all the omega-3 you needed to give you a gram a day. Uh, but most people aren't going to be eating now in Japan, Korea, um, other uh, Greenland Eskimos originally years ago. Uh, they all ate lots of omega-3. And that's where we actually the omega-3 story was discovered in Greenland, where among Eskimos eating a lot of omega-3 and having almost no heart attacks. Um, that's 1970s is when that was that observation was made and it opened the door to the whole omega-3 story. Um, so those kinds of fish, you know, there's a lot of other fish that people eat uh, like tilapia, uh, mm-hmm. maybe cod, maybe orange roughy. Uh, some of these are better than hot dogs, but they're not, um, they're not good sources of omega-3 particularly. So do, do you worry about like big fish having high mercury? Is that, or did, is that a concern? Um, I mean, there, there, there are four species of fish, uh, king mackerel, tilefish, uh, uh, swordfish, and um, what's the other one? Um, Shark. Thank you. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> Shark. I need an acronym for that one, right? Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. You know, things that hardly anybody eats, actually. Uh, yeah. And those are ones that, that are higher in mercury that the uh, FDA and others have said that pregnant women should mm-hmm. stay away from. So, you know, staying away from is not very difficult. Um, but that doesn't mean pregnant women should stay away from salmon or sardines right. or mackerel, which is a great sources of omega-3 for them. So, yeah, there is some mercury in those. Um, there's a lot of controversy as to whether... Uh, we're overly concerned about the mercury to the point of um, avoiding some very good foods. You know, so, right. some you know, some people say, yeah, yeah, "I'm not going to eat any fish because I'm worried about mercury." Well, that's you're putting yourself at risk by what you're not eating. Yeah, because you're avoiding some very good foods and that have almost no mercury in them, and uh, so, and that's probably another podcast. Yes. Yeah. So what, one thing, how do they react to temperature? So does it matter how you cook the food? W- would that denature them? No, it, it really doesn't. It doesn't. Um, the, no, the Because the, the, the omega-3s are, are, again, bound up pretty much in the cell membranes uh, mm-hmm. of the muscle. Um, so the, the cooking doesn't, it doesn't reduce. I mean, if you get a lot of dripping oil out of a, a salmon, Mm-hmm. You'll lose some omega three in the oil that drips out, um, right? But it's not denaturing it. It, it doesn't. Okay, it, it reacts okay to heat. Yeah. Um, okay, and you can also eat 
the algae. But but I guess the, the, the algae is not available as a food in any way. Not as a food, no, no. no. But the, but you're right. There are there are several companies that grow algae in, in vats, mm -hmm. ponds, whatever. Um, a, in a very specific species of algae. I mean, there are thousands of different species, and mm -hmm. there's a few that actually naturally make DHA or naturally make EPA, and they're able then to um, they're able then to harvest uh, the oil out of those algae and then encapsulate it and sell an algal DHA or an algal EPA. Um, but right, you don't eat the right. You can't eat it during. So if you can't get the fish or you don't like the fish, you can eat supplements, right? Yes, um, you can take supplements. And so what? I guess what kind of supplements should you take? Um, and what, what what should you look for in a supplement, like to know that it's a good quality? Um, well, first of all, you want to be sure. Sometimes the omega. The bottle will say omega three, mm -hmm. and it's actually flaxseed oil. It's the plant omega three. Nice. Um, so that's not really what you need a supplement for. We, we don't mm. need to do that. Then flax flaxseed oil, which is the most common rich source of alpha linolenic, um, is is not a substitute for fish oil. Um, so you want to be sure your product has EPA and DHA in it, uh, and so you have you have to look at the label. Uh, turn mm -hmm. around, look at the label, and the general idea is that the cheapest products typically have, um, if, if you do the math, you can see that they're about 30% uh, EPA and DHA. To, say, say that there's a 1,000 milligram capsule of fish oil. Mm -hmm. um, you'll see that 30% of that is EPA and DHA, so 70% is not omega-3. It's just other normal fats. Uh, fatty acids. Uh, so those are the, the cheap ones. Um, the EPA and DHA are fine. You just have to take more and more capsules to get a good dose. And really, the more concentrated they are in EPA and DHA, the more EPA and DHA per capsule. Mm -hmm. uh, expensive they are um, because it takes a, a lot of chemical work to purify them and concentrate them. But th those are also the ones that are the uh, have maybe the less uh, fishy taste, um, mm -hmm. less likely to be uh, oxidized or degraded in any way. So that's really what you look for. And, and plus, you, I think you look for products that have EPA and DHA, both of them, not just one, not just the other, but both of them and have them, you know, what ratio, nobody really knows the perfect ratio that in fish, number one, all, all fish that have omega-3s, uh, both EPA and DHA are there. So it's naturally there. So there's some reason for that. Um, and depending on the species of fish, it'll be more DHA or more EPA. It just varies uh, across different species. But it's it's never more than like two parts DHA to one part EPA or vice versa, something like that. Doesn't have to be 50-50 per se. Um, so I, I would recommend they, that both EPA and DHA are in the product. Um, and that it be a fairly high cost, say it's 50 to 70% EPA DHA, that's good. So that's interesting because I assume it takes, it, wait, wait, a couple of things. So I assume it may, it takes a fair degree of effort to separate EPA and DHA, just like it does to purify them. And uh, I did see that there was a study recently out of Salt Lake City um, by Dr. Lay, who, who said that yeah. like EPA, was it, he, it was EPA, is there any, yeah, he said like EPA only work better than the combined and and they do make supplements well, which are separate. So would there be do, any, yeah, would mm -hmm. there be any benefit? Uh, it's, it's hard to say, there, there's a one large randomized clinical trial with a drug, an omega-3 drug that's pure EPA. Mm -hmm. It's been, well, more than one, but. One big one that everybody knows about in the omega-3 space is called the Reduce It study. That mm -hmm. stands for something. Um, and that was just done with EPA. And it was quite successful in reducing cardiovascular risk, mm -hmm. total mortality, all, all kinds of good things uh, for, at four grams a day. So there are 4,000 milligrams mm -hmm. a day of EPA, which is way beyond anything you can get nutritionally. Uh, but mm -hmm. it still is just EPA. It's an right. EPA ethyl ester. 
Um, and so in that study, there was good benefit. Um, another study was done with a different form of EPA plus DHA that didn't work very well, didn't hurt anybody, but didn't help, <clears throat> which was a big surprise to everybody, me included. Um, and it's hard to know exactly what to make of that. Um, there's a variety of reasons why that might not have worked. Uh, but it doesn't mean that DHA is not important. It doesn't mean that DHA counteracts the beneficial effects of EPA, it, which mm -hmm. I hear some people who are just promoting the EPA product mm -hmm. are saying, which is, I don't think we can draw that conclusion. Um, right. So, but, but there is good evidence for EPA alone in high doses to, to be uh, beneficial for cardiovascular disease. Okay. Yeah. That's so, it. Okay. So EPA on its own is good, but both of yeah. them together is fine as well. Um, it's fine. Right. Right. Any, so they can go, they can go rancid, right? If they're not properly protected. Yeah. If whoever's producing the oil mm. uh, doesn't rigorously exclude oxygen mm. from contacting the oil, um, then the oil can go rancid and it can smell awful and be unacceptable. But every reputable manufacturer I know of uses nitrogen or argon or some other neutral gas um, always mm -hmm. around. There's always oxygen excluded. And once they're in that gel cap, mm -hmm. uh, that thing is impervious to oxygen too for for several years. We've seen it. So you're unlikely to find a really badly oxidized omega-3 fatty acid product on the market. Almost. So, yeah. Yeah. So a couple of questions. That, so it's just the oxygen. It's not the temperature. So like having them at no, room it's temperature, really, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Right. If you exclude oxygen, the temperature is not going to, to right. bother. It. Yeah. I mean, don't store it in the oven. You know, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, um, it's going to get crazy, but you don't have to refrigerate it. Right. Okay. And apart from, the taste being off, like if it goes rancid, it's not dangerous per se. It, it just doesn't, and that's, it's not that's, effective. Yeah. Yeah. The, the Norwegian group did a very, very special experiment, a shocking experiment to me, <laughs> where they intentionally oxidized fish oil, grossly oxidized it. Right. And then encapsulated, I mean, like bubbling oxygen through it for a day, you know, crazy things like that. And then they encapsulated the stuff. And then they did an experiment comparing that to a regular fish oil in human volunteers, just taking mm -hmm. capsules of great, badly oxidized. And then they looked for effects on infl inflammation or lipid disorders, and they couldn't find anything. <laughs> they couldn't find it did anything wrong. Uh, so, you know, it, it's first of all, nobody would ever have an oil that badly oxidized, but it didn't, uh, even then, it didn't really show up any signal for being damaging. So, right. When should you take fish oil? Does it matter during the day and in terms of meals? Should be taken with meals, with or mm -hmm. after a meal. Um, that's the best absorption. Um, right. Some people like to take it. Some people who, who get a uh, burp, a mm -hmm. burpy fish burp, um, which probably comes more from how fast your stomach empties. Mm -hmm. um, fast, fast empty, you're not going to have much of a burp. Slow empty, you might get a burp. Uh, but some people who have that like to take them at bedtime so that they're asleep when they're <laughs> when they burp. Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully their bed partner doesn't care. Um, but <clears throat> otherwise, taking them with food is the most important thing. OK. And, and then once a day is fine. You know, no reason to take spread them out. Does the amount people have to take differ based on, I guess, their metabolism or this kind of thing? I mean, do you see... Different inputs have different outputs in terms of the uh, omega three index. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's an area of real interest right now, um, to me anyway, uh, because you you can give ten people exactly the same dose of omega three every day, and you'll have different responses in the mm -hmm. change in the omega three index. So, what is that? What causes that? Is and there are, are got to be a million steps between when it goes in your mouth and when it gets in your red blood cell, um, and any one of those could be a um, obstacle or could accelerate the absorption. So we're trying to understand um, 
what why there's individual variability, but there's individual variability in everything. So and why right. why would we be surprised? Um, mm, yes. S- still, in all, we we think an optimal dose of omega three. Uh, say your typical American average omega three index of five percent, say, which would be pretty common, uh, and you want to get to eight percent omega three index. We have actually a calculator. Uh, based on some research we did, a calculator on Omega Quant website uh, that will allow you to put in your Omega-3 index, and then it will automatically tell you how much Omega-3 on average you you should start with to try to get up to 8%. Uh, so if you're starting at 5%, I think the calculator says um, you'll need 900 milligrams a day. Is it be a, it's no, not a guarantee. Uh, but it's a place to start because that's the, the the average response we saw to 900 milligrams was going from 5% to 8%. I've got my omega-3 is at four. And I said, okay, so I need to take like two grams of fat. But how long would it take to get up to eight? Yeah. So let's take that example. If you're an omega-3 index of four, which is not uncommon, um, and you want to go to eight, that from our this, that our omega three calculator, I was mentioning earlier, you need about fourteen hundred milligrams a day mm-hmm. to do that, and that estimation of four to eight percent at that dose, fourteen hundred, is roughly uh, assumes about a thirteen week supplementation period, about a four month, right? Which is about the the lifespan of a red blood cell. So it makes sense; all the red blood cells are replaced in four months. Uh, now you have a new steady state. It'll, so you'll you'll start creeping up as you, as you start taking your 1,400 milligrams of EPA, DHA. And it should steady out by three to four months. Okay, right. So I have one last question on supplement. So there's krill, there's yeah. fish. Is there any difference between the different types of oil, do you think? Yeah, yeah, there are. Um, both... So fish oil comes is an oil, uh, krill oil, I mean, a triglyceride fundamentally, mm-hmm. which, which is an oil like we talked about at the very beginning. Um, from krill, you get what's called phospholipids, which is also a lipid, obviously, mm-hmm. from the name. But it's um, in, instead of having three fatty acids on a chain, you've got two fatty acids on a molecule. Mm-hmm. Um, EPA and DHA are there. They're very well absorbed from a, a phospholipid form, a krill oil form. Uh, it's, it's just you usually have to take a few more capsules of krill oil to get the same dose of omega-3 right. um, than you take from fish oil. But uh, And that's an active area of study, too. Uh, it could be that the, fish, the krill oil is absorbed a little bit better or distributes in a different way. But they're, they're both good. Both good.